went for, uh, just to talk more about Home County this year, uh, what went into making it. And I am personally interested in, in finding out more about the history of Home County. I don't sure. know how long you've, you've been with the organization. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been, I've been with Home County for, this was my second full summer, but I did start in 2018. Okay. So they, they brought me in as, as the incoming artistic director uh, right before the festival in 2018 so that I could kind of see how the whole operation, how the weekend kind of went and got a little bit of a, a overlap with Darren Addison, who was the artistic director prior to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then after that festival, it was the, the reins were passed over to me and I was free to kind of go about and make it my own. So uh, Home County has been around, this was to be the 47th um, version of the festival. So it is the longest, the longest running festival in London. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been around for, for quite some time. Um, especially like, you know, in Vic Park, it's been in Vic Park every year. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of history, which is both really great and exciting. And then also, uh, it was a little terrifying coming into that role of taking something with so much history and, Uh, respect Mm -hmm. in the community, making sure that, you know, wanting to push the festival forward and kind of lead it into the the next generation, but also paying respect and honor to the longstanding history of the festival as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you feel like you do that as the artistic director of this festival? (laughs) It's, it's really tough. Um, It's, it's a combination of, you know, looking at what has traditionally been done um, in the festival, which, you know, for the longest time, it was the home County folk festival. Um, Mm -hmm. And about six or seven years ago, they changed it to the home County music and art festival. So the, you know, the tricky part is, is kind of knowing that for the bulk of, for the bulk of the community, they still see it as a folk festival. Uh, So, you know, trying to program in music that kind of fits that folk genre, which, I mean, to be perfectly honest, that folk genre can encompass quite a lot. Um, I mean, there's there's everything from the traditional singer songwriter solo artist with a guitar to, um, you know, indigenous throat singing from the Northwest Territories to, mm-hmm. um, you know, you can even count any kind of traditional music you can count as folk. But then there's also people from who used to play in punk rock bands. Like those are folk songs too, just like all punk rock and rock and roll. They're just folk songs, just played at a a different tempo with louder instruments Mm. Um, to even soul and and roots and jazz. So like the the folk genre can encompass a whole lot. So it's, it's a matter of, of still kind of keeping the rootsy feel of the festival alive, but also understanding that you know, we do need to evolve to maintain, to, to bring new people to the festival. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a matter of, you know, always like trying to bring new artists and new genres and new ideas. Um, you know, one of the ways in which uh, I try to do that is, is to kind of innovate and bring new, new acts that would have never, that wouldn't have played the festival traditionally. So mm-hmm. in this virtual space, I had DJ NDN, who's one of the founding members of A Tribe Called Red, come and do like a full blown dance party, like a DJ set, which 15 years ago, I don't think there ever would have been a DJ playing at, (laughs) at home County. Um, But I think it's important to innovate and try new things um, because, you know, that's every festival has to do that. You have to evolve. You can't just live in a, Oh, we've always done it this way. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in live events for a long time. And one of the things I'm always confronted with and like I, I like to tell people is the phrase, we've always done it that way. If you're living like that, that's where events kind of go to die. And that's where organizations run into problems. Um, so it's about finding that balance of respecting your past and paying, paying homage to the past and the history, but also kind of innovating and trying, not being afraid to try new things. Some people, will probably hate some of the <laughs> some of the new things that you try but you, you have to uh, you have to, to kind of keep it fresh and to bring new new people into the mix so on that um on that vein of innovation and folk music 
Um, how has the genre of folk music evolved to encompass all these different, you know, subgenres that we think in our head of punk rock, yeah. roots, jazz, etc.? Like, how would you then characterize folk music? For me personally, it, it all comes down to the song, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and folk to me is is storytelling. It's using music to tell a story. And I, I think that's at the heart of all music and all music that kind of evokes emotions. It is, it is that telling a story, getting a message out there. Um, and I mean, I don't know about yourself, but like I, I grew up a musician, I, I write songs. So like I, anybody who's kind of artistic in any way, you do feel when you're, when you're putting something, you know, out there artistically, it's, it really is, you know, putting a part of your heart and soul out into the world. And mm -hmm. I do think at the heart, at, at, at the base of it, I think that's what really the folk spirit is all about is, is kind of opening up yourself to the world and letting, letting people kind of get to know more or see more about what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when people really kind of put their heart and soul and passion into a project, I think that anything can be considered folk in that sense. Mm. I think someone who's someone who writes really good hip hop songs but if they're like telling a story and and not just talking about going to a club uh you know but like it like hip hop songs with meaning like that in my opinion has a place at a folk festival um so really it's about it's about emotion and connection i think at the end of the day and i think that's how you can how you can categorize things folk okay yeah interesting yeah, that that's um, it seems almost like a how I hear most connoisseurs of any genre characterize, mm. you know, their own genre, and that I think comes from a place of love. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, we're talking about music, and you know, I think I think people who like who love music love all types of music. You know, I I used to. I, when I was younger, I was probably a bit of a snob and was like, well, I don't like country music or I don't like EDM or something like that because you're wanting to be cool. But mm. like now it's, you know, my mind is so much more open to anything and I will listen to absolutely every, every genre of music. And I, and I think that, I think that most everybody can find something in any genre of music that they like, as long as they're mm. open to it. If you go into it with an open mind and, and then, you know, kind of, open ears to it you'll you'll be able to find something in every genre that you enjoy mm -hmm. unless you just don't like music which i'm sure there are people out there who don't like music um yeah and you know and that's totally fine yeah yeah I, it is. that's not me i <laughs> i don't think there's i was like i would be listening to music 24 7 yeah. yeah i hear you i hear you oh, especially now i bet <laughs> yep <definitely>. yeah <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, I hear you. Um, uh, yeah, and, and like, for me, I've, I've noticed too, that when I was younger, and, and when I was just first starting to really delve into the music that I really love, I wasn't so interested in looking at things that were more obscure, or, you know, uh, obscure is the best word, but in mm -hmm in like the, the vinyl digging world, it's rare, you know, I, I wasn't even, I, I was consciously not interested in that. And uh, now it's sort of the opposite, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very, very interested in that. And uh, my, you know, your ears sort of tick to different sounds, I think, as you, as you explore music more. Yeah. And, and I think, more. I, yeah, I think that's like, I think that's similar with a lot of people with a lot of different, I don't want to say hobbies because I, I feel like mm, something like yeah. music and stuff, I think it's more than a hobby, but I think, yeah. I think the same can be said for when people kind of get into, if people get into food or reading or art, I think a lot of the time you start with, Hey, what's really popular. What's, what is everybody saying is great. Yeah. You kind of, you start, you start there, you start on the mainstream. Yeah. Um, like as you were talking, like it really kind of, for, like for me, I read a lot of comic books, right? Mm. And when I first started getting into comic books, it was like, I'm going to do, I'm going to go through DC and Marvel mm -hmm. and like, I'm going to read all of the like 
essential stuff that everybody says you need to read. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, like, the more you get into it, the more it's like, oh, there's all these independent book publishers out there. There's all these other stories being told that aren't people with capes. <laughs> it's not yeah. superhero stories. Yeah. And now I barely read superhero stories. The The books that I'm drawn to are more of the independent it more like niche stuff and I think once you kind of open up and and you kind of dive into a world Mm -hmm. that's when things really open up and you realize like wow there's so much more that you can get into and I think that it really helps your helps your taste develop um Mm -hmm. and just makes you respect a lot more I think yeah so like I I always encourage people to like if you like something look at the fringe weird stuff yeah because it's really gonna open you up and that's it's interesting though. But uh, what was what were the vinyls that you first started getting into? Like, what was your like the mainstream stuff? And then do you remember what the kind of first sort of off the mark kind of road you went down in your in your vinyl digging? Uh, well, so to start off, um, the first vinyls I bought were like before I even had a record player. I just knew that I was going to get one, so I yep. bought I think uh, an Ohio Players because I knew the Ohio players and it was just a compilation. I actually bought a couple of like stuff that I didn't even know <laughs> first off the bat. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one was this um, record by an Arabic singer, an Egyptian singer named Um Kulsum. Mm-hmm. She's well known in the, in the Arab world, but, um, and what else was there? There were, there were two more. Uh, yeah, I, I don't remember the other two. But then when it became, when I started to collect more and it was, you know, stuff that I would recognize, um, just artists that I already knew and albums that I wanted to have and albums that I loved. Uh, And then I started to pick up more because I collect, um, I mean, it's been a while since I've been record shopping, so I almost don't feel like I collect right now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, um, the last few records I bought were online and it was a, a couple Marvin Gaye records. But um, nice. yeah, but but one of them was one was a record that, again, it's it's an album called "Hear My Dear," and it's not an album that people know very well. Mm-hmm. Versus, you know, "I Want You" or "What's Going On." Um, and to be honest, "What's Going On," like I, I'm not even a comparatively to Marvin's other stuff, I'm not a big fan of that record. That record was very mainstream, right. did very commercially well. But I've noticed, as with a lot of artists that that I like. Um, the lesser commercially successful albums that they have, I tend to actually sonically appreciate those much more. Hmm. And with Marvin in particular, this one record that I bought, when I did some research on it, it was hated when it came. Oh, really? Yeah. People said it was his worst album. (laughs) They said, you know, the reviews of the day were really awful. And then I think it was Pitchfork um pitchfork i think did a or maybe it was rolling stone did a, a like a later review of it just a few years ago and this album came out in like 78 but they did a review of it a few years ago and said this is one of the best albums ever and you know so it's just it's funny how um people's tastes you know do change uh yeah and i i, I think that relationship is a very individual one you know between yourself and music it, it's yeah. really hard to uh kind of be at one and I don't think you should you know I, I don't think I agree I don't think you should I agree and that's and, you know and that's something that I've that as someone who kind of puts on events and concerts and like it, it that's like an internal struggle that I think mm. not just myself, but a lot of concert promoters, festival directors, you're constantly running into that because I mean, I'm never going to make everybody happy with a lineup. Mm. Right. But at the same time, I don't want to make everybody happy because I, I want to challenge people's uh, personal thoughts of what they're going to see like at a festival. And I, I want people to discover new, new music. Like one of the points that I really try and make with programming this festival is I really want people to come to home County, and leave with one or two new favorite artists. I want them to come discover people that they, they don't really know and then leave with their music. And Mm -hmm. like, so it's, but at the same time, like I know there's people I book every year that there's going to be a sec, a a portion of the people coming to home County. They're not going to like them. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's, but at the same time, then there's going to be those artists, fans who really like them, who they might discover somebody else that they really like. So it's, but that's such an internal struggle, especially in the digital, the social media area or era that we live in right now. Uh, especially like the, the climate currently where everybody just has an opinion on everything and then they feel like it has to be in a public forum so everyone can hear their own opinion of something. Like I see everybody's comments about what they like and what they don't like. Mm -hmm. And it, it's tough. It can be tough. Um, it can be tough to be sitting there being like, I put this lineup together. I think it's really, really great. And then you hear, you just, you know, you get dunked on for something like that was, that had no place here. I didn't like that. <clears throat> and it's just a matter of being like, well, that's one person, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how often, how often do people go on social media to talk about stuff that they loved versus stuff that they didn't like? Mm -hmm. I think proportionally people are way quicker to put negative comments online than positive ones, which mm -hmm. is a sad state of affairs, I, I think. Um, <laughs> But like it's so much, it's so easy, so much easier for me to find the negative comments about, uh, or they'd stick with you more, right? Like you just you notice people saying they didn't like something that you did versus all the stuff that they enjoyed. So, mm -hmm. but that like that whole thing about, you know, um, people not liking certain music or it's, you know, and then your tastes changing and stuff like that. I think it's super. That's a really important part of music discovery and the mm -hmm. arts in general of challenging people's personal relationship and personal likes and dislikes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so going back to home County yeah. um, with, so, so you've been doing the uh, artistic direction of this festival for two years, you said two, yeah. or three. Yes. Two. Okay. So um, in the time that you've been involved with home County and, and of course, I'm sure before you became artistic director, you were still, somewhat invested or you went you participated you had experience at the festival uh what's the essence and feel of home county when as when you're there as a participant so i i like to think that the, it's you really get the sense of a small town you know it's a small a small town festival with some you know kind of big name big city perks mm. You know, the, the great part about Home County is it's accessible to everybody. We don't, it's, it's, ex it's excessively free. Okay. <laughs> you know, we say it's admission by donation. So okay. there are no hard ticket costs. So everybody can come. And I think that's a really important, a really important thing that we do. And Sunfest does it as well. And Ribfest and Children's Fest. There's a number of festivals that happen in Big Park who all do this. And I think it's really important to, to have high caliber entertainment available to people who couldn't who might not have 50 to 80 to $160 to go and see, mm -hmm. you know, um, big name acts come, come through. Um, and then for us as well, all of our, all of the vendors that come, all the like kind of crafters, that's all selected by a jury. So we have a number of people, like we won't just let anybody come and sell their wares. So you're not going to see someone selling, belt buckles with Texas longhorns on them, unless it's, unless they've, you know, forged them themselves. Like we don't, we don't allow people to come and resell items. So it's all handmade crafted artists, um, local and, you know, surrounding area artists and artisans who come in to sell their, sell their stuff. So it really does kind of give that like farmer's market, small town, you know, small town community festival feel. Mm -hmm in a relatively uh, big city with some high name uh, musical talent that comes through. So that's really kind of the vibe that we, that we really strive to, to kind of put out there. Um, you know, me growing up, home County was always a, a weekend that my, my parents always took us down and it would be, you know, you get to go and see someone locally who makes harps and guitars and you get to kind of pluck around with cool stuff. And, you know, you would see local, local musicians and artists that they were like friends of my, parents who were like you know playing at the festival which was cool to see people that you could see around town up on stage performing but then also you'd be able to see bigger name acts of like you know like the Gordon Lightfoots of like oh my gosh mm -hmm. Bruce Coburn like my parents listened to this record we listened to it in the car and then wow that's that person on stage mm -hmm. so that's kind of the, the the vibe and the feel that we really go for is that 
this is a community, we're all in this together. Everybody just come out, have a good time. Let's mm -hmm. celebrate arts and culture. Uh, and anybody from all economic backgrounds can enjoy this mm -hmm. without any barriers. Mm -hmm. So what does it look like this year? Uh, how do you recreate that virtually? <laughs> It not easy. <laughs> it definitely right. wasn't an easy, an easy thing to do. I mean, the main thing that for me that we had to do was make it free. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are a number of people doing virtual, virtual events and concerts behind a paywall, which mm -hmm. I get. Everybody needs to get paid for their work. Um, mm -hmm. I completely understand uh, the reasoning behind that. We were fortunate that we received some government funding to be able to put on uh, the virtual version of the festival. Um, <clears throat> so for me, it was, the, with the programming of it, it was really a matter of trying to remind people why they love home county. So I brought some, some artists who played last year, just as a, hey, do you remember how great last year's festival was? These were some of your favorites who played, they're gonna play again. And then also here were some people that were supposed to play this year who will be coming back next year. So kind of get ready for next year because here's a little preview of the, the talent and the caliber of artists who are going to be here next year. Mm -hmm. um, and then the way, that, the way that we put it together, um, you know, with me doing all of my hosting stuff from my house, I just really wanted to, you know, we, we thought about, oh, do I go somewhere do i set up a, a set or something do i get a fancy backdrop going and then we just kind of thought we're calling it stay home county let's just show our house let's just be at home mm -hmm. and then with the artists as well i really encourage them you know if you would like to go and rent a studio space and hire a video crew to give us a really high-end production by all means but at the same time like you know we're a really rootsy down-to-earth festival so post up in your backyard as long as you're capturing the audio and the video in a in a high quality fashion record from your backyard record from a forest do whatever and it was it worked out really great we had we had some artists in their family members houses we had some in their backyards uh, julian taylor recorded his from his great aunt's farm mm -hmm. um you know so it was just a matter of trying to capture that small town community feel in a virtual space. And I, th I think we did a, I think we did a good job. I think it, it came across uh, in a way that kind of did capture the essence of home County. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of our crafters and vendors to send little messages. So we were able to kind of promote some of the local, local shops and local people who are probably struggling just like everybody else right now with, yeah. uh, with the COVID situation. So I think yeah. we were able to capture it. Okay. I'm happy with the outcome at least. Well, that's a good sign. Yeah, that's, that's a good sign. If the artistic director's happy, yeah, it means you set out what you needed to do, uh, or you did what you needed to do. Um, mm -hmm. Is food a part of the festival as well? It is. Yeah, we we do have a, a number of food trucks that come in and, and local restaurants that kind of participate. Um, that was one aspect that was you know that's challenging to recreate in a virtual sense. You know, we yeah. we did encourage people to, you know. Uh, go out Uber Eats from a local restaurant, go out to some of the food trucks that come down because they're starting to open up around town. So we, we were encouraging people, mm -hmm. go grab some food, come home, watch it. I mean, it's still posted, so you can still do that if you would like. You can go get some food and then watch the watch the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, we do have, I think it's anywhere from 30 to 40 uh, food vendors at the festival every year too. So... With um, the coronavirus situation kind of shutting things down rather abruptly, uh, was it like a total switch around that you had to do as, as the planning uh, director for this? When, when did you realize that things would have to go virtual and you'd have to totally change gears for this year's festival? Yeah. When, you know, it was in March when everything, when they really kind of locked everything down, we very quickly started having conversations about what are our plans going to be? Um, <clears throat> there was a number of us, a number of the, the local arts and festival people all started talking almost daily. So ourselves, Rock the Park, Sunfest, Ribfest, mm -hmm. the, you know, the Fringe Festival, uh, Pride, we all were, were talking pretty regularly about, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to navigate this? When do you, 
you know, when is your organization need to make a final decision? Um, I believe it was in May when we all kind of announced roughly around the same time that we were going to be postponing. Um, and at the time in May, there wasn't any concrete plans to, to present anything virtually. It was a, we're postponing for one year. We're going to take the, take the year, everybody stay home. Let's all get healthy as a, <laughs> as a people mm -hmm. and we'll all come back, you know, strong and ready to go uh, next year. Um, you know, we received some government funding to do it. And then the more, the more kind of time went on and the more, the more other people were doing virtual programming, it was kind of nice to see that as like a proof of concept. So other festivals were doing it, concert venues and concert series and artists themselves were putting on virtual shows. Um, I feel there was a huge boom of them in early April. Mm -hmm. And I, Personally, I felt that there was a little bit of an oversaturation. I think a lot of people went, hey, here's a virtual show, or I'm going to do Facebook Live every day. A lot of artists were doing that. Um, mm -hmm. And there was like a huge boom. And like, personally, I was a little concerned with like, are people still going to be interested in, you know, and kind of like what we're doing right now, I think a lot of people professionally, those who were able to keep their jobs, because I know, unfortunately, a lot of people were, you know, furloughed or laid off. Uh, but like for myself, I was on Zoom eight, nine hours a day. The last thing I would wanted to do after a long day of staring at my computer screen, talking to people was to turn on my computer again to watch a show. Mm -hmm. I had I had some Zoom burnout. Um, mm -hmm. Fortunately, as things started to open up, I think people kind of got more used to the idea of the virtual shows. So yeah. we made the dis we made the full decision to really kind of go full steam ahead with the plan. And it was I was probably early June, mm -hmm. which was right around the time my, my daughter was born June 4th. And it was right around that time that I remember having the planning meeting with home County, just being like, Hey, you know, my daughter's due in a couple weeks. So depending on when she comes, I'm going to take some time off to just do the dad thing and be at home. And we might have to push the push the festival back a bit depending on how the planning happened and then she was born the next day oh <laughs> which <wow>. was hilarious <laughs> so then it was like okay well i'm gonna take a couple weeks now and then when i come back we'll we'll see how quickly we can turn everything around because we had planned to go on this one weekend in july mm -hmm. so realistically we we planned and executed the whole thing in about a month that's crazy which comparatively to we usually start plan like we've got a, we'll probably start planning next year's festival this week. Like we usually, it's, we're usually planning and, yeah. and setting up for all, you know, it's a long plan. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hours that go into it. Yeah. Granted there's, there was less moving pieces with the virtual festival than the in-person one, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty in, an intense month <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with, you know, a lot of work that went into it and, I, I by no means did all of it myself. I've got an amazing board of directors, an amazing group of volunteers and committee people who, who really kind of stepped up and, um, and helped out with, with being able to pull this off in that short amount of time. Mm. What are some of the, um, the smaller or lesser uh, predicted details of organizing a virtual festival? T to me, I think, you know, the main thing is getting the footage um from the artists yeah. and also making sure that it sounds good yeah. so working on it there um, yeah all the technical stuff for sure I, yeah. I mean the one the one that it was it worked out really well but one of the artists that i really really wanted to present and we were able to is this group alash who are from tuva which is a republic between russia and mongolia wow and so they were like, yeah, not a problem. They can get the video to you. And then it took about 10 days to get the video. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and they're like, I hope this works. Um, it takes about nine days to get a message to all of them because they are all scattered in with their herding communities in Tuva mm -hmm. and internet's not exactly super, super great in the area. So it takes a long time to get messages to them. So I hope this works. And you know, fortunately, the video was great. The performance was fantastic. It was exactly what I was hoping for. So it, mm. it was great. So those kind of technical aspects um, were tough. It's a lot of the smaller stuff, though, that 
you know, when, when putting together the online show, when we're talking to our production company, Streaming Inc., who kind of helped us with all of the back end stuff, it's the small stuff like, okay, can you get your graphic designer to do like a transition slide? Because we don't want abrupt cuts. We want to make sure that it looks professional and, mm -hmm. you know, make sure you've got a video editor and to get the transitions done and these vendor videos, cut them together. And then for me, it was basically going from being a festival director and this is how I put a concert lineup together. to then I'm, I'm scripting and doing cue sheets. Mm. So it's basically like a television show producer, you know, mm. I'm, I'm working with television show software, like production software now. So I know how to run, I know how to do a rundown <laughs> for like, mm. for like episodic television, which is weird. Um, what software did so you work with? <clears throat> um, Showflow. Okay. Um, is one that's my, the, so my other job is I work for a booking agency. So we're doing a lot of, a lot of virtual stuff too. So, mm. and we're doing a lot of stuff in, in this, like it's called Showflow. So I'm just using that to like, draft scripts and cue sheets and okay when does this video need to be played and there's just a lot more organization mm. in the in the back in the back end than yeah. than what you know i mean it would be very similar to yourself in like putting together radio programs like yeah. you need your cue sheets on like when is the stinger going to go how long is it okay and then you need your hosts to know how long they have to talk <laughs> and then there's like okay this song has like a 14 second instrumental intro that you can talk over before the lyrics start like that whole process too right it's it's just it's really interesting the small things that come up when you're like oh we'll just they'll send us performances we'll cut a yeah. video together and put it on facebook and it's easy yeah and then no not easy, not <laughs> easy. no definitely not <clears throat> yeah yeah I, i've been hearing that so much like um everyone who's working in this kind of industry, this kind of job is doing TV now. We're all doing TV yeah. now. We're all doing yeah. radio now. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. And like, yeah, so many people are starting podcasts now and like, and now they're like, Oh, basically like working in radio and stuff. I'm like, well, a little bit different, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very interesting to all of a sudden make that shift. And you're like, yeah, we're, we're producing a, a 90 minute television show. Mm -hmm. Is what we're doing. It's mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about the details of how the festival is going to run. Um, we are, we're going to get to how it's going to run on Radio Western, but um, aside from that, how, where is it going to live? Where is it going to stream? Are you archiving it? What days and times, et cetera? So it's, it is up on our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's at Home County Fest. Uh, and also we've got a YouTube channel that just started. If you just look up Home County festival it'll be on there as well okay. um so it will live there for a couple of weeks uh and then we will be taking it down we are archiving it ourselves okay. um so we will be we will be putting clips up later on um it's you know part of the contract with artists is you get to have it up for a certain amount of time and then you know if we would like to repurpose any of the footage i always like to get you know, you need to get permission from the artist to make sure that they're comfortable with you using their footage, et cetera. So, so it will be up for, for a couple of weeks for people to go and watch, and then we will be pulling it down for a bit, but it'll probably come back. Oh yeah. <laughs> it'll probably come back in, in some facet that we'll, we'll probably do limited runs, you know, use it for marketing for next year's festival. Yeah. Um, you know, have clips go up of certain artists that are playing next year of, Hey, here's their performance from last year. Mm -hmm. You can check out the, this three song performance. They're going to be at the festival coming up in a month. Make sure you come down and check out Leela Gilday, who's incredible, by the way. <laughs> mm. What were yeah. some of the perform? What were some of your favorite performances? Or if, if you don't want to name a favorite, uh, yeah. what was the best thing about the performances for you this year? I mean, the band from Tuva was just, it was just incredible to get, you know, traditional Tuvan throat singers to mm -hmm. send us something all the way from Russia. Like that was really mm -hmm. special. Mm -hmm. um, but just the amount of, I'm always blown away by the amount of talent that we have locally and, and nationally. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a single performance video that came back that I was like, that could have been better. Mm -hmm. Like it was all, I was blown away by every single person. I, I think some of the crowd favorites from the, from the comments that we were seeing, 
Uh, Julian Taylor, everybody loves Julian Taylor. He's he's an amazing performer. Mm -hmm. uh, Leela Gilday as well from the Northwest Territories. So the, the two of them, um, those were really, really, really great. But I mean, I could, honestly, I could name every single person. Like Wolf Saga's performance was great. Tara Lightfoot's was amazing. Ken Yates was great. Like I could name ev absolutely everybody and, and find something in there and claim that it was my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's really tough, but um, <clears throat> just all in all, I think the whole thing went off really well. And I think that there's def. I was getting messages from people saying I had never heard I before. I am just going to go and I bought his record after watching that performance. Or yeah, yeah. Or wow, Ken Yates's new record is incredible. I didn't know he put it out, so I'm gonna, I went and bought the vinyl of it. It's coming yeah. in the mail. So yeah. Yeah. That's good. And then that's great for artists, you know, who yeah. their main source of income would have been live performances. And um, now more attention is being put towards their records, their recordings. Yes. And that's yeah. really good. That's important. I agree. Yeah. 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 So we will be um, streaming the festival. We're more like broadcasting the festival uh, for two weeks. We're splitting it yeah. up over two weeks. Okay. Um, it's happening Wednesday the 29th from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. And then the following Wednesday after that, which is August 5th, also from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. So if you want uh, a chance to listen to the festival, maybe a little bit more relaxed because you won't be working yeah. <laughs> or having oh, to do I'm anything. Right. <laughs> um, uh, and just, do you need me to send you the audio file still? Uh, I need to send those to you. You, I think so. I, I was expecting to get them from Amanda, but okay. yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll arrange I'll, it. Yeah, we'll arrange it um, because I believe you know all your audio is good to go now because your hosting stuff yeah. is done as well. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and I know Radio Western has has been there, um, has been coming to the festival too, and I believe we did live broadcast there for a number of years. Yeah. So yeah, home county. When I started um, last year, I think it was right around the time that Home County was supposed, was going on. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something I would hear about a lot, you know, Home County, we go every year at Home County. So yeah. it is sort of, I, I think around Radio Western, it is kind of like a staple festival too, yeah. much like some of the other ones like Sunfest. And, Sunfest, yeah. 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 Did you watch Sunfest's live stream? I listened to it Oof, on, on the it radio. Good. It was so Ooh. good. Yeah. Ooh. Mercedes and Alfredo, man, they are, they are doing great. They bring unbelievable talent to this town. It's, Every year. I, I really don't think people appreciate it as much as they should. Oh, me still. neither. Yeah, still. It's been, it's been 26 years, and it's one of those, like, and I think it's, it's one of those things that, you know, people, I don't want to say ignorant, but people are ignorant to how big some of those artists are in their respective countries, that, like, getting them to come to London, Ontario is bonkers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I agree. I, I don't think it, uh, it gets um, the shine that it deserves. I mean, it's a very well-known yeah. festival and it's been going on for a long time here. Yeah. Um, but it, it's just, it's like incredible, you know, it's a mind blowing festival. So yeah, they do. Yeah. A, they do a phenomenal job. <laughs> they yeah, really, really do. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. Well, Again, um, big ups to you guys for pulling oh. off the same incredible feat. Thanks. <laughs> it was a, you know, a labor of love and I really enjoyed it. You know, I was sleep deprived and stressed out leading up to it, but seeing it all come together, I mean, it's the same as the real festival or, you know, any mm. kind of major concert or event, like it's super stressful leading up to it. And there's always days where you're questioning, like, why am I doing this? This is... Mm this is bonkers. I just want to relax. Um, but then, <laughs> but then when you see it going on and you know, you're still stressed out and you're watching it being like, please have no tech issues. I hope everyone's liking it. Um, but it makes it all worthwhile when you, when you see it all come together and, and you see how much people appreciate it and, and enjoy it. And um, for me, that's, that's what kind of keeps me going in this industry is like, you know, people's lives people's lives are really stressful especially right now and if i'm able to provide people some relief from the stress that's going on and just sit back and you know have a nice meal have a have a cool drink have a nice hot cup of tea 
-hmm. and forget about issues and just watch something incredible and get kind of lost in music then that's that's why we all do what we do and and like that's that makes it all worth it 100 percent. that's what these live streams have been for me you know even yeah. the impromptu ones uh not related to a festival but a dj or something like that that's exactly yeah. what it's been for me it's yep. it's been a huge stress relief and really therapy absolutely it really kind of uh just like makes like how important artists are yeah. just for everybody's mental health yeah <laughs> seriously if we, if we didn't have any of this stuff going on they would be depressing seriously so, and it's, yeah. it's like you know let's take artists seriously now <laughs> mm -hmm. you know i see a little bit of that coming out now too i do i think so too i think a lot people are kind of really understanding like oh wow yeah this is really important artists are yeah. super important right now so yeah, let's yeah. let's take care of them a little bit more and everything so hopefully yeah. that kind of continues as things open up and get back to normal i'm hoping that people get back to going to to live music i mean again i'm an old man so <laughs> i remember like when i was 16 17 going to all ages shows that call the office and the embassy and all these bars and like i don't know any of these bands on the bill but it's 10 bucks i got 10 bucks i'll just go and watch four bands i've never heard of um and i think that with youtube and spotify and how easily accessible music is for people now hmm. i think a lot of that has been kind of lost people aren't taking chances and just buying tickets to go see a live band that they don't know or go to a festival to see bands that they don't know. So I'm, yeah. I'm hopeful that when we come out of this, we see kind of an uptick in that and people are, people understand the importance of going out and seeing live entertainment. And so I think I'm hopeful. Yeah. Trying yeah. to be optimistic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we really don't know what to expect because on the one hand, people miss that, you know, I, yeah. I personally miss that, um, seeing a live music performance and being around people who are sharing in that energy and reacting to the music yeah. and dancing and feeling it and all this. Uh, one thing though is kind of the fear. I think we'll have to, we'll have, for some people, um, mm -hmm. you know, we might have a serious sense of paranoia. Mm -hmm. uh, for some people, I don't feel that way. And, and yeah. I'm like, well, that's great, <laughs> you know, you, but uh, for me, it, I think it'd be kind of hard to get over that paranoia. And then the other thing is, uh, yeah. you know, these, with these virtual events, there, um, there's a part of me that's like, you know, I hope that this doesn't become too popular because we might lose uh, the appeal of, of a live event due to yeah. the cost savings of a virtual one, for example. It's true. Um, at the same time, it's a really good alternative to not having it yeah. at all and keeping yeah. safe and all of this. So it's a balance. And, you know, I think whatever happens in the world, you know, um, with regards to this virus is going to tell mm -hmm. people, you know, or going to inform people how they really do feel. Yeah. And yeah, but, but honestly, at the end of the day, like life, we really do have to save live performances. We have to protect that and save yeah. that because it's yeah. something and very it, sanctified. Yeah, it, it is. It is interesting because I mean, with you know things are opening up, et cetera. You know, you can have gatherings of fifty people. You know, they're talking about having you know small live performances. But like me personally, because I've got a tiny human in my house who doesn't have an immune system, like mm. as much as I'm missing concerts, like I can't go. Yeah. Yeah. Or I'm just not, I'm just not going to, yeah. um, <clears throat> which is, you know, brutal. Um, but at the same point, like, I'm really happy that people are doing more virtual stuff. And I'm happy that like the technology is there too, that even, even when things do get kind of back to like normal, the technology is in place now that should there be live concerts, people can, you can properly do a live stream Mm -hmm. And I could, people like myself or others who aren't comfortable going into crowds could mm -hmm. sit at home theoretically and be a part of that event and watch it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the things that's going to come out of this. I think the streaming technology and the accessibility and people's understanding of how to utilize it. Because mm -hmm. I mean, live streaming has been around forever. Well, not forever. Mm -hmm. It's been around for a, a long, you know, a few years. Mm -hmm. But I don't think a lot of festivals and large events were really utilizing it mm -hmm. to the same extent that they can now. 
Mm. You know, it, it's something we were looking at this year for the in-person home county was, can we live stream it? Can we live stream our main stage so that those who cannot come down to the park or aren't comfortable coming down to the park or have health issues? You know, we have a, an older demographic as our core audience. Mm. Some of them might not be able to travel from North Bay, but mm. they really want to see. So can we live stream it? You know, so I think that, I, I do think that, everybody's like being forced into live streaming is going to okay. come out with more options being, there's going to be more options for people to do it. So mm -hmm. I think it's, be, I, it's great. Mm -hmm. Again, eternal optimist. I'm all, I always try and see, <laughs> see what's the, what are the positives that can come out of this horrible situation? So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we gotta, we gotta make the best with what we have and, and this exactly. is pretty good. You know, it's pretty good. Yeah. It's accessible. It, it lets it live on. And that's something to be celebrated and very happy about. So I feel you on that. I definitely do. Yeah. I definitely do. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Well, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we wrap it up here? I think the only thing is like, if people want to keep involved, like follow us on the socials at home County fest, pretty much everywhere. Or if you go to homecounty.ca, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter, but we send that out, you know, monthly or when stuff's coming out. So that's free. We don't, sell our list obviously we don't spam people with useless garbage mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but uh yeah and then as always you know because we are a not-for-profit if people would like to donate to us we would very much appreciate it mm -hmm. um all the information for that is on the website as well so homecounty.ca sign up for the newsletter you can donate awesome. listen to chw more support <laughs> chw donate to them too <laughs> why thank you tim <laughs>